Hi, so yeah, I'm Yalda. Um, I studied uh, mechanical engineering whenever I was in college about 10 years ago, and uh, I ended up working in product management for 10 years after that, and I decided to change my path to get into the space sector, so I took some night classes for astronautical engineering. I thought it was going to lead towards, uh, you know, applying for a master's program, but it led instead towards creating a uh, company first called Space Cooperative, and our mission was to create a, a social collaboration platform so people can crowdsource and crowdfund space missions. Um, and five months after we, you know, uh, incorporate our business, there was an article written by a futurist, Julia Prisco, and he proposed a decentralized autonomous space agency, which was very similar to what we wanted to do, but it talked about how you can you know, create this ecosystem by creating a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, so uh, we reached out to him. He was calling it Space Decentral. We decided to, you know, merge our visions, and, um, and then that's how uh, we started to lead, lead towards this more, you know, utilizing blockchain to um, execute on our vision. Um, a lot of times when I talk to people about, uh, you know, what we're working on, they always say, well, why, why focus on space when there are so many problems we need to solve on Earth first? And, uh, you know, these are some of the reasons that I talk about sometimes. It's like, okay, well, we wouldn't know about, you know, climate change if it wasn't for space technology. We wouldn't have, you know, like, uh, like some, some of these, like, in insulating technologies that we use on buildings all over, um, all over Earth if it wasn't for, you know, trying to develop these space missions and, you know, have that protection from the harsh space environments or, you know, uh, it's also like space is such an in, uh, inspirational thing that it is something that can bring humanity together to focus on something, you know, as a unified species. So there's also that. And then just like the drive to, to understand the universe more, to, un to explore like that you know, curiosity that's just in our human nature. So it's like we can't just shut that off from us. So that's why uh, I'm focusing on space and also the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey also really inspired me. <laughs> So yeah, what is Space Decentral? Um, you know, we, we aim to reinvigorate the push for space exploration with global citizens in control. Essentially, we want to create an international space agency. Um, so it will be decentralized because no single corporation or nation will be responsible for its management. It's autonomous because like the members that are part of the network, they will control you know, how work is directed, how decisions are made, and also which projects to fund. And then it's a space agency because the goal is to really come up with a strategic space plan, a space program, not, not just to always select random ideas, but to actually build a roadmap that accelerates our timeline into becoming a space-bearing civilization. With the ultimate goal, it's like, you know, it's about expansion, expansion of knowledge, expansion of humanity throughout the cosmos, and, you know, expansion of just being a, a collective as a, as a human species. So um, in this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, aerospace crowd history, just kind of like the history of crowdfunding and crowdsourcing in aerospace. Um, one example will be XPRIZE, and then I'll talk about kind of the, the trajectory towards the uh, XPRIZE type model into the Space Decentral model. Um, and then I'm going to talk about phase one of how Space Decentral currently works right now, um, and then phase two of how it will ideally work. So aerospace crowd history. So you can um, probably say the starting point of crowdsourcing in aerospace uh, might have been the Deutsche Prize in the 1900s, and that was for you know the challenge was to um, to you know build a, an airship that goes from this uh, airfield in France to the Eiffel Tower and back. So it was about 11 kilometers round trip, um, and yeah, that was awarded to a, a Brazilian. Um, and he won $100,000 for that. And then there are a few other prizes, you know, from the 1900s until the 1990s, like the Ortiz Prize, but some of the ones that you probably have heard about recently are the X Prize. And the first X Prize was also space-related, and that was uh, $10 million for the first non-governmental organization to launch a reusable manned spacecraft. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that was awarded in 2004. And then the recent one that we've all probably heard about is the Lunar X Prize. And uh, teams have been working on that for about 11 years. And they recently just canceled it um, this year since no one was able to uh, launch their uh, landers in time. But 
What did happen as far as those X Prize teams go is even though the prize was $30 million, over $300 million of funding went towards these different groups that were developing these uh, you know, lunar lander technologies or um, rovers or what have you. Um, so some of like the top examples are Space IL, and they were the Israeli group, a nonprofit. Even though they were a nonprofit, they were still able to get you know, $95 million worth of um, contributions, some from the founders of the team, philanthropists, a little bit from the Israeli Space Agency. Um, iSpace, they're a Japanese company. Um, they actually just recently got 90 million or so this year, or like the large amount of it was this year. Um, and then Moon Express, um, and yeah, they have, they've had about 65 million. They, I think they just recently qu closed a pretty large round. So, so I guess like if you think about the incentive structure here, um, Space IL is an interesting example because they were a nonprofit um, there were only 30 uh, paid members working on the team, but 200 volunteers essentially working for 10 years without any pay at all. Um, so a lot of the drive for that was to just like work on something challenging, inspire people. And I think that's kind of uh, what is great about space is it brings people together to accomplish the impossible. And it's not always about the financial reward, but the financial reward you know, can still be a nice motivating factor, but it's not an ultimate requirement. Um, and then as far as like crowdfunding goes in space from like the, the micro citizen level, um, some of the projects you probably heard about are uh, ARCID, and that was Planetary Res Resources crowdfunding project. Um, and that was like your prize would be, you'd get a selfie of yourself in the backdrop of space, um, but they actually, uh, ended up giving back people's money for that because they that they didn't even though the the crowdfunding campaign was successful they still didn't have as much external funding to fully execute on it um, and then there was the light sale by planetary resources I believe that they try, they launched that first mission but it didn't end up working out well but they're planning a light sale too right now um, and then a recent one was a uh, just for like a telescope. Um, so yeah, now I want to talk more about you know how we go from the X Prize to something like Space Decentral. So right now in Space Decentral, we actually uh, we actually announced uh, an open source lunar program in July, uh, and since then, um, you know people have been working on the space mission in a very open manner. We have weekly meetings on Mondays. Um, people. <coughs> um, yeah, we have weekly, weekly meetings on Mondays. Everything's like in an open, you know, Google Drive and GitHub. You know, everything's like transparently organized. It's not really on the blockchain yet, but I'm going to talk more about phase two and how it will progress to, to that. But essentially, um, the objective is to demonstrate in situ resource utilization technology, or ISRU, uh, to 3D print on the, moon's, uh, on the moon's surface using lunar regolith, or like, you know, the moon's moon dust as feedstock, so you wouldn't like send anything else to print, but you'd you know, mine the local resources to eventually you know, start off with printing a brick, and then after like, subsequent missions, you can eventually print a habitat, and that can ultimately reduce the cost of space travel if you can uh, do ISRU on the moon. Um, so yeah, this is our flagship mission, and whenever we ask some of the people that are part of the, the team now, like what motivated you to join, like some answers were, uh, make friends with like-minded people, or just like space, or uh, you know, a, a chance to participate in something new, or to be an asset to society, and then a few other answers were you know more space-specific, like a potential for uh, advancing interesting lunar projects, or interested in space resource utilization. So it's like a, a broad uh, area of interest as far as why people are participating in this project. And yeah, right now, uh, like I said, we. We launched, we announced this mission in July, and w there's about like 20 people that are actively contributing to the project. You know, a lot from America, Canada, India, Australia, Sweden, the UK, uh, Brazil, as far as like people's heritage goes. Um, and we want to, you know, keep uh, keep growing the network. And it's actually like we haven't really focused that much on the publicity and, and growing more team members for this because the problem is if you want to like grow it from like 20 to 100, like the skill you need, you need like project managers, you need people that are gonna, like going to be very diligent about like the task management, like leading groups. So that's just kind of like what we're trying to hash out throughout this process is if you really want to scale, you need 
you know, you need to be better at task management, you need to be better, you need to be better at project management, and, and you need people on the team that want to do those skills, because a lot of people are actually interested in more individual con contributor level, like doing the actual, like, okay, like, research or design, because it, uh, it's, like, kind of a side project, and, like, doing project management on, on the side isn't always that fascinating for people. <laughs> So how does it initially work? So right now we have a Space Decentral network, um, spacedecentral.net for collaboration. It's, it's a, so, a centralized social network. It's not on the blockchain yet. Um, eventually it will be a, a decentralized application, but for now it's more of a forum um, to you know, track the different projects um, and it has like an integration with Google Drive. Um, and then, like I said before, we're using GitHub for project management. Um, so yeah, we're kind of laying down the different tasks, and we're also going through a process of kind of starting to estimate like the relative value of one task to another, as far as like how long it will take to complete it, um, because that is what will ultimately go into the phase two, which is properly attributing you know work where it was done. Um, but this is like uh, like some of the recent work of the network is you know doing a trade study to um, to to uh, decide the manufacturing method like uh, whether it's going to be microwave sintering, solar sintering. There are you know different additive manufacturing methods, and the group is going through trade studies to determine the best one. And then also you know there's there's room for people that aren't scientists or engineers too like uh, we had a task on GitHub. It was, it was just like design a logo and then these are some of the designs we got uh, I we're leaning towards uh, something that looks like the last one right now so we're just kind of iterating on that so how does it ideally work so how this is how a space agency works as far as NASA goes um, you have pre-phase a concept studies um, and then there are all these like design reviews and you know, concept, uh, you know, phase A, technology development, phase B, all the way up to phase F when you're closing out the mission. So there are all of these milestones in between and there are all, a lot of review processes as well. So if we want to create this decentralized network, you need to design the system that it can at least support maybe a, a slightly leaner version of this, but you know, you would have different experts that would be matched to the different review cycles. Um, you would have different conditions that need to occur before you know funding is opened up or before a concept is selected. Um, but that's just kind of like a, a high level overview. But yeah, so it's like how how are we going to do this? Um, you know, we're going to have a, the Ethereum blockchain at the lower level as far as tracking the value um, of the money that will be flowing through the ecosystem or the contributions of each person. Uh, we're going to be using Aragon uh, for governance and it's also a decentralized application framework. Because if you're a decentralized autonomous organization, that means governance and decision making is the core of what you're doing. Um, so Aragon will support you know, the voting on uh, which projects to fund or even uh, voting on if you want to create a technical council, electing that technical council, deciding when you might want to dissolve that technical council. So just because you're a decentralized autonomous organization doesn't mean it's always going to be completely flat, but it means that as a collective you can decide when you want hierarchy and when you want to get rid of it as well. And that's similar to how worker-owned cooperatives work as well. And then Space Decentral, that will be um, you know, more of a focus on the scientific or distributed engineering tools. So for the work that we do on Aragon, those will be more generic applications that any DAO can use, but then the Space Decentral ones will be you know, how we can f further build upon it to support the scientific and engineering community. Okay, so I think I have about six more minutes. I'll try to quickly go through this, but, um, but the Space Decentral DAO will be a two-token ecosystem. So one is FTL, or faster than light, and that's the transferable token that can be purchased and it can be staked for governance rights, and it's also used to prioritize the higher level program, so a token-weighted vote on if the uh, network should focus on Mars, Moon, Earth, so you get a, essentially a distribution. And that higher level um, vote essentially determines how many SDN you mint per program each year. So if, uh, if the vote said we should do like 70% Mars, 20% Moon, 10% Earth, 
that's kind of like what your supply of SDN will be. And you'll do these votes usually like on a yearly basis or whatever the network thinks makes sense as far as being able to, you know, make progress on the space program. But SDN, it's, uh, it's minted by the DAO uh, as they see fit um, and it's awarded to intellectual contributors. So essentially, SD, like there will be SDN on every task and if you complete a task, you collect SDN. So you can start to just see who is, you know, who are the top contributors in the network. And it's, uh, you know, it's decoupled from the one that can be purchased because that gives the network more flexibility to do interesting things. And then um, similarly, what you can do is, since FTL is the one that has value, you can decide, you know, oh, on a cyclical basis, we're gonna like distribute rewards to the contributors. So you can th think of this as an evolution to the X Prize model, where instead of, you know, thirty million dollars at the end of the year after you do this goal, you can, you know, do things more like maybe on a yearly basis, you distribute five million dollars to everyone that's active in the network. So um, that's that's how we think we can evolve this this model and how. You know, if 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 you create something like the X Prize again, instead of you know having like 50 teams compete compete against each other, maybe there's a way you can do it that encourages collaboration. So you could have actually you know sent that lander to the moon because there are so many uh, you know intelligent teams working on it. Maybe with this new way where there is uh, you know better contrib or be uh, better way to track everyone's work, um, you know you can share the prize. But at the end of the day, you saw that. Uh, the, the money that was put into those projects I mean, far outweighed what the prizes were anyhow. Um, so right now we have a space mission activation process where people can come up with different proposals to be uh, selected for crowdsourcing. So, so essentially there's a curation process before a project is fully activated on the network. Um, so, you know, uh, you can post an idea, start to discuss and form teams, draft the proposal, uh, get feedback um, and review, and then, then it'll be filtered to make sure that it kind of fits into the model, it's open source, etc. Um, and then, th in, in parallel, people are developing Space Central, like they're working on the Coral mission or they're helping with the tools, they're collecting these SDN, and that gives them uh, a voting share to actually participate in the process to select one of the proposals. So, there are, so these are kind of like the two parallel ways that people can contribute. It's like, if you have an idea, you go through like the first track of proposing missions, but if you just want to contribute to some of the active missions already, you can contribute to those and then that will give you a stake to vote. And then, um, yeah, so this is essentially the mission activation vote. If you had a selected mission, you also get SDN for that. And then um, what happens is, just because your mission was selected doesn't mean you and your team are gonna be the only ones working on it. Like as, as part of submitting this proposal to the network, you're submitting it to be an open source project. Um, so as a, as a collective DAO, you know, the, there will be like a more of a detailed project plan developed with tasks and then people from the network can start to work on it. Um, and then how is FTL awarded? Um, essentially, it, it kind of goes through a, a process where you have these tasks, they have SDN um, allocated to them, uh, so a contributor con uh, completes the task, and then eventually, um, whenever a reward cycle occurs, they get FTL in proportion to how, many, how much SDN they collected. Um, so right now what we're working on is developing a, a suite of applications for Aragon and we're calling it that planning suite. Um, but essentially these are the different tools that the, the DAO will be using to allocate funding and uh, make decisions. And uh, any, any other organization that wants to also do similar types of crowdsourcing and crowdfunding can use these apps and you don't, it has nothing to do with our token. You can have your own two token ecosystem to, to build your network if you want to employ similar processes. So this is what we're kind of giving back to the community and how we think applications should be developed in general as far as like if you want to develop an application for a DAO, you don't have to tie it to your token. You can, you know, to develop these common tools together so you know all, all organizations that want to operate in a decentralized manner will eventually have this you know fully fledged enterprise suite. Um, so here's an example of a tokenized task management system. Um, I mean it's much more detailed how it works but you know uh, people can uh, estimate bounties and then you can get approval from the entire organization to actually fund it. 
And then this is kind of like the rewards ecosystem where you can create a new ward, a new uh, cycle, to, um, map which token it's allocated to, and you know how much that allocation is. Yeah, so <laughs> it's unknown what the future holds, but it's up to us to shape it. That's uh, Spacey Central. Thank you very <laughs> much, Yalda. Thank you very much.